It's a tall order keeping up with the shopping list of a telephone company. Last year, Bell System companies consumed exchange cable containing enough wire to reach more than two-thirds of the way to the sun. They gobbled up enough telephone switching equipment to service two cities the size of Boston. And oh yes, almost eight million telephones, about as many as France and Belgium have right now. Making and supplying equipment for this tall order is the job the people of Western Electric have in the Bell system. Western Electric is dedicated to providing your Bell Telephone Company with the finest equipment at the lowest possible cost. Western Electric, the people who make Bell Telephones and the communications equipment of the future. Not only was his last space flight 10 years ago, but at 47, Alan Shepard is America's oldest active astronaut. David Shoemaker talked with him about his age and his long grounding. The joke we heard when we came down here was that uh, the command module was named Kitty Hawk in honor of your first mission. Are you getting a little tired about all this talk about your age? Well, you know, the long gray beard does get in my way once in a while. Uh, I don't know, I guess it's pretty hard to avoid that kind of talk. It's no secret that I am uh, that old. And uh, it does... Uh, it gets a little unnerving to have to be forced to think about it uh, from time to time. I, normally, when I'm not talking to reporters, I don't think about my age. <laughs> have you been, uh, let's say, uh, a bear as a result of being grounded? I wonder, you know, how you've been to live with. No, I think, uh, I think during the grounding period, I found other things uh, in the space program to occupy my attention. So that wasn't a difficult time for you? I didn't say that. What would you say? It was difficult for me, uh, for example, on the Gemini days when I was uh, along with Deke Slayton, we used to alternate as directors of each of these respective flight crews, to be with a crew during the uh, final stages of their training and, uh, and help them with their policy-making decisions and these kind of things. And, uh, and take them down and uh, get them suited up and take them to the launch pad and then watch them go away. These it, sure have been difficult times. We've talked to some people who have likened you to, to a superman and uh, others who have said uh, you're determined never to grow old and others who have said whatever you're assigned to do, whatever it may be, you can do it. And others who have said you, you don't like people very well, you don't need them very well. What, what really is there about you, do you think? Who are you? Well, I, who am I to decide? I don't know. You know, a person can't analyze himself. It's important to me to, uh, to do this because of the self-satisfaction involved. I think everyone needs this sort of thing. And I suppose that's really who I am, an individual who, who likes to make a contribution to his country because he knows he can with a certain level of confidence. Perhaps that's the easiest way of putting it. Former astronaut Walter Sherraw is with us again on the flight of Apollo 14. And Wally, you and Alan Shepard were part of the original seven Mercury astronauts. I wonder what your strongest impression of Alan is. Well, I think without doubt it's the, the cold, fishy-eyed look that you get when you first meet Al. Then, of course, you realize that he is a cool customer. But with time, you realize he's also a very warm, sensitive fellow, but a, a great leader. And this is, uh, I guess, the best impression I could give anybody. I remember in those early days of Mercury down here at the Cape, uh, Alan was as much of a fun lover, one of the boys, as anybody else. Some of the pieces that have been coming out lately, the stories from Houston have suggested he's aloof, uh, unfriendly, cold, as you mentioned. I think perhaps that's because of the job he had. He, in these 10 years, has been assigning the astronauts to the flights and the jobs and supervising them, and that doesn't lend toward friendliness. That's the that's the chill of command, isn't it? It is very much that. In fact, uh, I guess you can say that uh, we all felt that. Uh, each one of us, really from a guts feeling, would admit to being something of a prima donna because we're, we're focused on so, so often. And uh, someone has to be a super prima donna, and Al had to be that. He had to give the orders. The younger ones who didn't have the responsibility or the experience didn't take that too well, I suppose. You know, speaking of being prima donnas, uh, 
The seven Mercury astronauts have always been considered something rather special. Do you think that there's something special about you seven? Well, the only thing I would concede in that sense is that uh, we were all small town guys, average fellows. Uh, most were the senior child, if not the only child. But the, uh, the uniqueness really was the, the sense of pioneering. We were doing something that no one else really wanted to do, it turned out. Uh, at least our contemporaries, a number of test pilots would say, what are you going to get in that can for? Well, that's sort of the special that I might at least accede to. And you're all very close, aren't you? We are. We're just all seven brothers is what I'd call it. Wally Shira and I and the rest of the CBS News space team will bring you the highlights of this Apollo 14 mission starting with Sunday's launch. That broadcast begins at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can also see live and for the first time in color the two moonwalks on Friday and Saturday mornings and we'll be on hand, of course, for the splashdown Tuesday afternoon, February 9th. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center. Good night.